Today, I'm driving the car that started the compact SUV craze back in the early 90s. It's a Mark I Toyota RAV4. Now, if you watch this channel regularly, you will know that I'm no fan of SUVs, but that's more of a modern thing, believe it or not. Going back in time to say the early 90s, when things like this were around, I actually quite like them because they're a bit novel and a bit different. It's only now that they're replacing actual good cars like Focuses and Golfs with silly faux four-wheel drives that I don't like them. Going back to 1994, when Toyota brought out the RAV4 and it was amazing, I thought they were really quite cool. And they are. Let's take a look around this one. Now, it might look like a concept car, and that's with good reason. It is. At the 1989 Toyota Auto Show, this was on Toyota's stand as a styling exercise. But in 1991, it got signed off and put into production. Code 153T, as it is known internally, is a unique platform, but using a lot of parts spin parts from the Carina and the Corolla. So a lot of mechanical parts that are fairly common to Toyota. So it makes it a very reliable concept car. So this thing made it into production in 1994. 95 was a five door. And the body styles came as a three door, a five door, and a three door soft top. So it was something for everyone, but it was a completely new genre. It was taking elements of the ever popular four wheel drive movement and combining it with that small compact dimension. And it was a winner. The only thing that came close to this before was the Suzuki Vitara, but that was far more of a lifestyle car rather than this, which was a proper four wheel drive. Hence the name RAV4, Recreational Activity Vehicle Four Wheel Drive. Toyota do love an acronym. So look at this body styling, the, the tough plastic side skirts, the big bulbous bumpers, the generous ground clearance. At the time, this was a real novelty. This is something really quite exciting and different because either you went for a hardcore four wheel drive like a Defender or a Jeep or a Land Cruiser, or you went for a compact car. The, the whole idea of a compact four wheel drive just wasn't really a thing apart from the Jimny, which is also a hardcore four wheel drive. So making a comfortable hardcore four wheel drive it was quite fun. Although this was also the first of the 4x4s because you could option it as a front wheel drive only. Look at this mad design. Look at this way the swage line just starts high, swoops low through the door, up again and down across the bonnet. It's just a beautiful bit of design. It's really quite weird and unusual. Frog face, square backed, curvaceous in the middle, and these big scallops which Land Rover kind of stole for the uh, optional body kit on the Freelander in the late 90s. Look better on here though, to be honest. Look a bit wrong on the Freelander. It looks right on steel wheels as well. Let's look inside. Before I climb into the car, just check out the fabric on these seats. This is just so of its time. It is just pure early 90s nostalgia fabric. It's Ren and Stimpy, Saved by the Bell. All those wonderful things. Look, it's almost metallic in the blue parts. A quirk slash feature of Japanese cars of this era and America ones, a lot of these would have been sold, is that bing, bing, bing when you open the door. Don't you love that? No, no one does, it's horrible. But one thing this car doesn't have, which a lot of Japanese cars of this era did have, was a little button to take the um, key out. So it's quite nice not having that. I'll leave that on the floor so it doesn't bing at me. Now this is a really spacious and airy interior. It's a headroom forever. Although it's not very wide, I mean, the car is virtually as long as it is wide and as it is tall, it's like a big block on the road. Um, you don't have a lot of elbow room, but you do have masses of headroom. It's quite impressive. And you sit, obviously, quite high up in an SUV position. Not as high as a lot of SUVs, um, but yeah, comfortably above the rest of the crowd. It gives you a better view out of junctions and things, which is kind of the point. Obviously, the raised suspension gives you that little, little lift. Although I'm well up in the driver's seat and feel like I'm very high up, I feel quite low in the car, if that makes sense. The seat doesn't adjust up and down, just backwards and forwards. But I feel like the dashboard is quite high on my chest. It's, it's very Toyota, the black and grey plastic, the switch gear, it's all 90s Toyota. Obviously the parts been parts out of the other cars I mentioned and some unique things. But let's have a look around. Now this is a fairly low spec, although it says GS on the side, it's not a high spec car at all. <laughs> You've got three blanked off squares and a blank off for your cigarette lighter in the middle of the dashboard, which tells you you're not in the highly optioned version of the car. This even has manual windows. Apparently, this car actually belongs to the Toyota Press Garage, and when they bought it, it had an aftermarket electric window kit fitted. So they've retrofitted uh, manual windows to take it back to standard. I have no idea where they found the parts from. Now, look at these doors. First of all, you've got a proper off-roader's grab handle here. So if this car's going upside down over a cliff, you can cling on for dear life. Hopefully it won't do that, it's quite squat and solid. That aside, in the door, you've got a utilitarian plastic 
door handle, you've got a manual window winder, electric windows were an option in higher spec vehicles, and you've got this huge kind of mat pocket, it's not very wide, only like a about four centimetres wide, but very, very deep, and with little holes in the side, quite a practical idea really, holes in the side of it, so that you can see what's inside there, and also a baffled rear section, so you don't lose stuff, and also a front section, which looks like it could be for a bottle or a cup, but it's kind of too narrow. I don't know. Also a loudspeaker in the front door pocket. So I don't know if that's just a wiring pre-install or if every car had speakers regardless whether a radio was fitted or not. That'd be interesting to find out. But uh, that kind of information is really hard to come by these days, sadly. We've got a tiny weeny cubby hole, which is a really weird size and I've no idea what you'd use it for. And below that, we've got a fog light switch for the rear fogs and a blank door switch, which I only assume would be for front fogs if it had them fitted. And looking at the dashboard, it's not as square as you first think, because even though you've got this big block in front of you with fairly geometric edges, everything's got a slight bow to it. There's a little lift over the dials, uh, nicely rounded off corners, so it does actually look quite quite pleasant. With speedo, that goes to 120, a fuel gauge, a temperature gauge, and a rev counter, and a few warning lights. Being a Toyota, none of them are on. Over to your left, you've got a little digital clock, because digital clocks were cool and exciting in the 90s. It's funny how they've kind of gone backwards, and now it's nice to either have something built into your big LCD screen or an actual analog clock if you're posh. Back in the 90s, an LCD clock was posh. A couple of little vents for your heater, and then your standard fit every Japanese car for about two decades, heater controls. Recirc, fresh air, high, low, temperature direction, yada, 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 the usual stuff. Finally, on the heater controls, there is a blanked off panel, which I guess would be for air conditioning. We don't need it today, it's freezing. And you've got a rear screen heater, hazard lights. These blocky lights feel a little soft in the dashboard, but the switches themselves are really nice and clicky. So it feels like there's a bit of movement in the dash panel itself. It's funny, cars 30 years ago, although we look back on the fabled weren't dent building like they used to, they weren't actually as solid inside as current cars are. In interesting little disconnect between memory and reality. Now this is really cool. This button here in the middle, diff lock. This is full-time four-wheel drive in this car, but on a soft rotor, a compact SUV just for designed for a bit of everything really, not a serious hardcore off-roader. How good is that? So you can get yourself into and out of some really quite exciting situations. That's really cool. Looking down, we've got an aftermarket radio, so some of these cars came with nothing, some car came with a radio. This one now is an aftermarket, so moving swiftly on. Heading down the dashboard, got a nice big cubby hole, a perfect size for an iPhone these days. Um, good size for CDs, actually, I think. You probably put about four, four discs in their boxes there. And down below, we've got a blanked off cigarette lighter socket, so no 12 volt output on this car. Three blanked off something else's, maybe electric window switches, and then dippable headlights, so you can change your aim if you're carrying heavy goods or towing a trailer. Then we've got a big ashtray, but no lighter, so it's just a little bit of your sweet wrappers here. Moving back to the gearbox, five-speed manual, or an optional four-speed auto, should you desire. Behind that, we've got a little, little tray, which is partly for your knuckles, maybe for odds and sods. Little coin holders. Who ever used a coin holder? Every car had them back once upon a time. Now, getting into the important consumer information, there's a cup holder here, a cup holder here, and a tea shelf. I know the Japanese took a lot of styling keys from British cars of the 60s and 70s, but they've done brilliantly here. They've adopted the latest trend and cup holders in the car, and they've got a tea shelf, so you can have full tea options however you desire. And of course, a glove box, which is not massive, but big enough for the original owner's manual. The car in front is a Toyota. Do you remember those adverts? Oh, official fuel economy information. We're fascinated to know what this is. Um, RAV4 petrol manual. It reckons it gets a combined 27.2 mpg. Constant 56, 39.8, and at 75, breaking the speed limit, 29.1 mpg. That's quite interesting. I'm glad I found that today. Finally, the steering wheel, which I missed off. This, with 135,000 miles on the clock, is a little bit shiny, but once upon a time, was textured. It's a really heavy plastic thing, or rubbery thing, which feels very, very solid, and it's got a little beepy horn, which is quite sweet. Between the steering wheel and the dashboard, we've got our stalks. Our wipers on the left, indicators and lights on the right. Now, let's look in the back and see what else we can find. Right, climbing to the back, 
there's quite a handy little thing. There's a side switch, also a little tag on the back, so you can press it if you're in the back of the car and get in as well. An unusual touch. Now I'll climb all the way through so that you can see what the realistic legroom is like. There's not a lot, is the answer. Um, this is with my driving position, um, and so although I've got a ton of headroom, and the elbow room is quite good as well, because this is only a two-seater. There's two seatbelts fitted, and the seat splits down the centre to fold 50-50. Little tag here brings it down. So the seats folding back are quite nice. You can also tilt them back as well, so you can recline for luxury take the headrest off, these will go flat and turn the car into virtually a double bed. Well, a single bed. Well, a cot. Looking around, we've got more speakers. So they've really thought the audio out quite well. Got a nicely lined headlining and a little light here in the middle, which is good. Uh, there's a little cup holder on both sides, so each passenger has a cup holder. There's one here for the driver as well. Um, little ashtray again, still no lighter socket. And we've got little mysterious plastic panels either side. The passenger side one, Looks like it would be a fire extinguisher, but there's no one there now. And the right hand one uh, is the toolkit. If we've got a flat tyre, that's, uh, that's where the jack and tools would live. Um, beyond the grab handles, there's not a lot else to say. Quite a nice bit of styling, the way they've moulded or integrated this channel for the uh, seat belt into the side of the plastic panel. It's a bit nicely thought out design, carefully thought through. And finally, you've got a little pop-out rear window, so a bit of ventilation in the back. I'm going to say it's okay. I wouldn't want to do a long drive in here, but I wouldn't mind taking a short trip in it. I'm going to get out now. Now here under the bonnet is a two-litre Toyota four-in-line engine, which made 127 horsepower at launch. Later on, some markets got 177 horsepower. I don't think the UK did though. Because it's a four-wheel drive, taking many other four-wheel drive cues, spare wheel here on the back. Toyota Rav4, full-time four by four, and side opening, which is not always the most practical, but in this case. Look at this, look at the way that the door completely folds down below the boot line, meaning you've got total ease of access into the load space, although it's not huge load space, let's be honest. But you can pull these little tags, which mirror the ones in front, and you can tip the seats completely forward, and you suddenly get a bit of a van. With the seats set to the upright position, it's sort of a usable space, not very really comfortable for your back seat passengers. This is kind of why there are so few of these things left on the road. You virtually never see a Mark 1 RAV4 anymore because they've all just been used to death. They are incredibly practical, incredibly useful, incredibly capable, and being a Toyota, they go on forever. So they've gone from being a fashionable runabout to a cheap utility. So any job that needs a bit of, bit of ruggedness that maybe go off road once in a while, one of these is ideal, even if it's just for a farm hack. Perfect, huge space, goes anywhere. Straying briefly from my shoot location, here we have a repainted in green little grey Fergie. I know it's a Ferguson because it says Ferguson on the front. However, that as far as I can see is the only identifying feature. Is this uh, a 35? I can't remember. I'm not a great tractor expert. There's a writing on the seat which says Heroes of Wexford, which I guess might be the people who made the seat on its kind of sprung metallic seat. We've got power in the battery by the look of it. No oil pressure because it's not turned on. No speedo because it doesn't go very fast. It go very fast. If anyone can tell me what model of tractor this is, then do let me know. I think it's a Ferguson 35, but I'm not really sure. I'm not by any means any kind of an expert. I'm guessing it's in the late 40s, early 50s. I'd love to take it for a drive. It looks hilariously good fun. Anyway, back to the RAV4. Okay, first of all, before I drive anywhere in this car, I will point out I missed the lighter socket. It's here, hidden. I, it was behind the steering wheel, so I couldn't see it before. Down here, tucked away between the radio and the steering wheel, so I have no idea what this blanking plate is for. And let's see what it's like driving one of the first proper compact SUVs. The engine is very smooth and quiet. And the transmission, while a little bit notchy, is fairly light and easy to use. And you can kind of tell it's from the early days of compact SUVs because it's still quite soft in its ride. This still does roll into a corner. 
and even at 40 miles an hour it's a little bit bouncy and wavy it's got that kind of 60s car feel to it like a 60s saloon car is how an early compact SUV it kind of feels it's an interesting little buzzing sound almost from the engine it kind of has a, almost a little kind of gentle whining noise to it According to the odometer, this car's got 135,000 miles on it, but it seriously does not feel like that at all. It's really tight, really nice to drive. Now, with 129 horsepower at your behest, it gives it a 0 to 60, I would guess around 12 to 14 seconds. I couldn't find an actual figure, but a top speed of 105. And it actually feels quite brisk. It pulls away quite lively. And being full-time four-wheel drive, it's actually quite willing to put the power down and just go. It gives it a really fun, willing feel that makes it like you want to play with it, really. As always, you do quickly get used to indicating with the wrong hand or the correct hand, depending on your point of view. Although you are high up, it doesn't really feel incredibly high. You do feel taller and there is a certain amount of pitch and wallow as you wibble the car around. Now, although this car's not massively rapid, it's not a sports car after all, there is an even slower version because it, in California they did an EV version, a battery powered one for about three years with a 67 horsepower electric motor. I've no idea what the range was, but this is going back to the late 90s. So this is very different from the current crop of EVs we're used to. Now this car, well this model, ran until 2003 with very few changes. I think in 1997 they refreshed the front and rear lights and did a few trim updates to make it, you know, to keep in with the times. On the whole it wasn't changed significantly at all in its whole nine year run. And then by the time it was replaced in 2003, the compact SUV market had matured and grown and become the, the emerging popular segment in the car market really. And so the second generation RAV4 was a very different thing. Gone was the crazy frog face styling and the, the weird curves and the, just the, the curious individualism. But that's where the market they'd created had gone. And so Toyota, in order to continue being a serious contender, had to carry on with that. The interior feels really tough and really well made, like it's going to last forever. In fact, at 135,000 miles, it's halfway to lasting forever already. And it still doesn't creak, rattle or fall apart in any way, it's just a bit shiny on the steering wheel. The seats are kind of squishy and soft, but not massively supportive. There's a bit, it could do a bit more in the lower back and there's not enough forward coming to support the back of your knees either. So I can imagine on a long journey, this might be a bit tiresome. I actually drove a RAV4 across America a few years ago. It was a later generation one, I think it was about a 2013 or 2012 model. And that had grown up a long way. It felt like a really mature, sensible car, and it was incredibly capable and quite comfortable as well. Now this is incredibly capable and incredibly reliable. <clears throat> but I think I might have got out with a bad back after driving coast to coast <laughs> in, that, in this one. I believe a certain Welsh-based YouTuber, who you probably are aware of, had one of these at one point and I think he kind of leveled the same criticism and that the seats weren't as comfortable. Well the turning circle's good if nothing else when you go off your route. The thing about these cars is that you really just don't see them anymore. They've probably been driven or worked to death which is a, a shame because they were such fun little cars. It's a kind of quirky, individualistic thing that very few car makers are willing to take a risk on now. And Toyota, despite their image of, you know, staid reliability, are actually quite good at throwing different ideas out and just giving it a chance. So where did it all go wrong for SUVs as far as I'm concerned? It's when SUVs or compact SUVs like this, and maybe the Freelander, stop being a niche market that was interesting as an alternative and became the mainstream because when it comes to day-to-day -day driving 
a regular five-door hatchback is a better car. It's better than any SUV you can name. It's going to handle better, it's going to be more economical. But when this came out, this was exciting, this was different, and this was fun. And this still is. This has still got that curious, quirky, different hilariousness to it. And I really like it. Is it time for me to have another Toyota on my fleet? Maybe it is. Maybe it is. And I don't mean an AE86 or another MR2, because that's obviously the first thing I would go and rush out and buy a given the chance. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this little trip into a category of car I generally shun utterly. But because it's the first, I felt, but because it was the absolute first of its kind, well, apart from the Vitara, but that's different, um, I felt it was worth a inclusion on that merit alone. I hope you liked it. Join me again next time for something utterly different again. Please hit like, please hit subscribe, all the stuff that you know you've got to do. See you soon.